So I'm a Hirsch, one of the founders of uh, Opacity. You can find me on a Farcaster as Euler Lagrange. Ishmael and I are gonna get married in the fall. <laughs> uh, but we primarily focus on ZK TLS and we probably are the odd ones out in this uh, talking lineup today. Um, and my own personal journey into ZK TLS came out of an observation where we basically live in a world uh, with a poverty of verifiability. Things, very simple things that you'd want to prove, things like where do you work, how long have you worked there, how much money do you make, have you made GitHub contributions, stuff like that. It's, I would say, I would classify as like an unsolved problem, especially in like an adversarial decentralized context, right? If you're trying to bring this type of data on chain, uh, it's just, there's a poverty of verifiability there. Now, like why do we need verifiability? For one, uh, in the Oracle problem, if you're trying to bring data from off-chain on-chain, there has to be some way to like be able to verify that data, usually like a signature or like a ZKP. Um, and even with like ZK, this is like a subtle uh, it fact that a lot of people don't think about, but ZK really only works if you have information that has this property of verifiability associated with it, right? Um, and if you don't have that, it's like garbage in, garbage out. You can't really uh, build a system that, uh, where like the trust is transferred between all the parties. And so like ZK right now is basically limited to the few things that are verifiable in nature. One is blockchains, right? There's a lot of excitement around state proofs and rightly so. But like the, the amount of signed data that we have in the world is very little. JWTs, if you're using something like OpenID Connect, uh, emails are actually signed in a system called, uh, system called DKIM, and also passports like exposed signed data over NFC. And uh, the very few uh, verifiable credentials out there, which is really not that much. And because of all this, we're basically stuck with like shitty Oracle systems like Chainlink. Um, but so <laughs> uh, the main bottleneck in flooding the market with verifiable data is really uh, cooperation from the parties that have uh, like the data that we want, basically the servers, right? So if you want to get your bank statement as like a verifiable credential signed, the only way to make that happen is you have to go talk to the bank, you have to convince them to add code to their servers where they have to start uh, spitting out signed uh, statements, right? In that cooperation, uh, there's like been many companies in the decentralized identity space raised like tens of millions of dollars and they've basically done nothing because of this bottleneck, right? And so the goal of ZK TLS is as a way to get around like the biggest bottleneck here. And the way we do that is something you guys have all stared at uh, when you're using your computer, but maybe you haven't thought too much about, and it's uh, HTTPS, right? Um, and so the, the TLS part of HTTPS, I think was originally added to Netscape by Mark Andreessen when people started like shopping online and they're putting their credit card numbers uh, into online stores. Uh, but it's like absolutely crucial for secure uh, like browsing the internet safely today. But HTTPS is really three things. HTTP is the boring part. SSL is just end-to-end -end encryption, but it's susceptible by itself. It's susceptible to a man-in-the-middle attack, right? You don't really know who you're talking to. You can just make a secure channel. And then TLS is how you solve for the man-in-the-middle attack. And it, as it exists today, this is like one thing that if if people were building TLS when blockchains were around, it would be on chain, but it's really just a centralized system where you, you buy some domain and then you're issued a certificate where some certificate authority says, okay, this is like the public key for this domain. And the idea of ZK TLS is uh, to piggyback off of the authentication that you'd have in, in HTTPS like networking call uh, and then generate like a ZKP of the transcript, right? Simple example, I have at least $5,000 in my bank, bank account and the data came from uh, api.chase.com. Um, and ZK TLS is actually like, it's simple to state, but it's actually a very hard problem, especially if you're trying to bring this data on chain, right? Uh, so to understand why it's such a hard problem, it's, we have to talk a little bit about how SSL and TLS works, where basically you have two key pairs. The client has a key pair, the server has a key pair. The client verifies that like the, in modern TLS, they use ephemeral keys, so like the, 
the server generates a random key and then signs it with its actual certificate to get properties like forward secrecy. But once you have these two key pairs, you do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange to get a shared secret, which is just some point on your elliptical curve. And then you hash part of the shared secret to derive a symmetric key. And actually in modern versions of TLS, or yeah, in TLS, you actually generate two keys, like the client and the server uh, encrypt and it decrypt uh, like uh, their data with different keys. But the fundamental issue is the client actually knows the key that the server is going to use to encrypt the response, right? And this makes it so it's like you just making a request uh, on your computer or on your phone, uh, you can, you, you're not allowed to trust that because the, like the user can swap out the ciphertext arbitrarily, right? So in order to make HTTPS verifiable, we basically have to complicate, the, uh, complicate things. And uh, there's really only three ways to go about it. There's like three architectures you could think of to solve this problem. One of them is to just like offload the actual cryptography on the client side to a, a TE, like SGX. Um, I don't, especially if you're trying to bring this data on chain for like proof of humanity or DeFi use cases, I don't think people are gonna settle for the like hard Intel trust assumption there. Then uh, the simplest like uh, architecture that I'm not a fan of is the uh, proxy architecture where you basically proxy the request through an intermediary and the intermediary signs a statement of like what data they saw go through the pipe. And there's a few reasons I don't like it, but the main one is at scale, this can actually get blocked because the IP address of the request is not the user's. Uh, so this is actually like a, a signal that you can give to the server that like something is off, especially if they don't want you extracting information from their systems. And so the third architecture, the one that I'm a proponent of and the one that we use is an MPC scheme using uh, garbled circuits and oblivious transfer where like a, the user doesn't know the shared secret, but we in an MPC scheme with what we call a notary node, you actually uh, encrypt the request and decrypt the response and you notarize the transcript uh, that way. And, the, and one thing to note is that garbled circuits and oblivious transfer is fundamentally like a two-party MPC scheme. And the, the advantages here is like you can actually make the request from the user's device. And so it's assuming it's fast enough, it's actually undetectable by the actual server that you're getting data from. It's also uh, completely privacy preserving. So you actually leak no information uh, to the MPC node when you're making the request or like no auth tokens or cookies, anything like that is uh, leaked. And there's actually a uh, nice censorship uh, resistance properties where because modern TLS, we use ephemeral keys, it's actually possible to set this up where your MPC nodes actually don't even know the servers. Like they don't know that uh, data from api.chase.com is actually being notarized. So uh, like if the government is pissed that there's people generating proofs from like cia.gov, there's actually no way to stop. Uh, you, you, they can't like sue someone to stop it because these uh, nodes don't know where the data is coming from. So I'm a proponent of this architecture because at scale, I think this will last the longest. Um, so great, we, we can use an MPC scheme, but can we actually bring this data on chain? The answer is no, <laughs> not, not, not with uh, what I've explained because uh, there's a, still a collusion issue where if your MPC node and the user collude, they can reconstruct a shared secret and they could swap out the ciphertext uh, uh, arbitrarily. And I got, like, I, I got to this point a few years ago and I actually thought it was impossible to solve this case if you're trying to bring this data on chain. I'll, I'll take you through like a, why I thought, why I think that or why I thought that. Um, but like one obvious question you might ask is what if we just add more parties into the MPC scheme and like uh, make it harder to break the trust assumptions there. And so if you're looking to do that, you have to use uh, a Shamir secret sharing based MPC scheme. Like I said, oblivious transfer of the garbled circuits is fundamentally like a two party thing. And it's unfortunate, but there's like a key part of the SSL TLS handshake where it's just gonna be really slow to do in this type of MPC scheme. And that's because you have your shared secret, uh, which in a SSS MPC scheme is gonna be sharded amongst many parties. You have to hash it in MPC and you have to pre prevent reconstruction of the output too. And that is like a really non-trivial thing to do. I don't know anyone who's actually implemented something like that. And the hash functions that we're using are like SHA-256, uh, not like Poseidon. Uh, and so, and Shamir secret sharing based MPC schemes are fundamentally like algebraic. Uh, but if you're curious about this, MP speeds is like a really good uh, paper, set of papers and a code base. 
you want to play around with it. Um, so, but I'm pretty confident we're stuck with a two-party MPC scheme. So the next question you might ask is, what if you just generate the proof from like multiple nodes? Um, and here we actually run into issues if you're not careful. One is, if you don't require any economic security, you just have like nodes that you can, and as long as you have proofs from like enough nodes, you basically have built Chainlink at that point. And like a, an important thing to note is like Chainlink has to be centralized because if it was decentralized, the risk of something bad happening is much greater, right? Because if I wanted to fake a proof, I could just, if I needed six uh, proofs from different nodes, I could just run six uh, nodes on the network and then generate proofs from those and, and I know they're gonna collude with me. And so if you wanna do it by, if you wanna do proofs by committee, you need some like economic security or basically slashing. And uh, the issue here is actually doesn't work in the general case because you can risk honest nodes be being slashed. And just to give you an example, let's say I'm trying to generate a proof of my bank balance, right? I have $100 in my bank account. So for the, in, like a committee of 10 nodes is selected. For the first two nodes, I generate a proof of $100. Then I make a debit card transaction uh, to make it, let's say like 95. And then for the next six nodes, I generate a proof of that. Then I make another debit card transaction. And then for the last two, I generate proofs for 90, right? So the first two and the last two disagree with the, the quorum, which would be the middle six, and so they get slashed even though they did nothing wrong. So you can't do like ZK TLS proofs by committee if they're slashing, if the user can actually like change the actual response in between requests. So no, so no proofs by committee. Uh, what, like what can we actually do to, if we wanna bring these types of proofs on chain? And I thought this was impossible to solve, but this, I actually stumbled into a really elegant solution because I was working on the Farcaster contracts. I was thinking about how we could use like Web2 identities in the Farcaster ecosystem, let's say like your Twitter handle, right? And the easiest way to go about this is, well, a lot of applications like already support ENS. What if you just had like an ENS style contract uh, where you just like mint ownership over some Twitter handle and then like naturally it'll work across the ecosystem. And it turns out having like a web two identity contract like that, it actually leads to a really elegant solution uh, to the collusion problem. So, and it's fundamentally like a subtle shift in perspective versus like any cryptographic wizardry where like I'm pretty confident if you try to solve for the collusion problem like directly, you're gonna end up with solutions that are so slow, you're gonna time out the request before you can actually do anything or you can like notarize anything. And so, but if instead we have like a reliable way to detect if someone is trying to collude, then like indirectly we can solve for the collusion problem. And there's really only three parts. One is a, a random selection of the node uh, on the network, and then a, a commit and reveal game, and then a way to implement civil resistance. But imagine we have like a decentralized network of nodes, right? The first trick is we have the user commit what they're trying to prove before that node is selected, right? And it's like that task is assumed to have failed unless uh, the user can prove that the commitment was satisfied using like a proving network, for example. Um, if you don't want to like lock up the user uh, like in the UI. So I'm, I'm a malicious user. I'm trying to forge a proof that I have a billion dollars in my bank account and there's some notary on the network that's ready to collude with me, right? So assuming it's uh, sufficiently decentralized, I commit like a hash of a billion dollars. Uh, if the like the node set is large enough, there's pretty low odds I'm going to get the colluding node on the first try, so that's like one failure. Let's say I do it again, you'll get another failure. Uh, but if you do it enough times, you're guaranteed to hit the colluding node and like fake that proof. But because you've like left a verifiable log of attempts of like failures behind you, the protocol can still like reject the proof. And so the astute amongst you might be asking, well, what if I just use a new wallet address every single time? Uh, which is true, right? Every time I get a fail request, I could just like uh, cycle to a new wallet address with a clean history and you just keep doing that until you hit the colluding node. And this is where the, uh, the inspiration from Farcaster actually comes in and the Web2 identity contract is, uh, the first thing you have the user do, uh, like in our protocol, is prove ownership over some like Web2 account. And in the case of Twitter, the primary key in the database for your account is just some like big number, right? And it's a static thing that never ch changes throughout the course of uh, your like uh, the activity on your Twitter account. And in no Web2 system, are they gonna let you change the primary key in the database? Your Twitter handle is just like a, 
a handle on top, like a mapping on top of that uh, that's, that can be changed. And because the account ID is a static piece of information, you can prove that by committee, and there's no risk of uh, getting honest nodes slashed. And so, basically, if, uh, what, if you like, try and collude in this system, you'll end up burning that Web2 account, because the first thing you have to do is prove ownership over a Web2 account. You have like a, man uh, a mapping of a uh, Web2 account ID to a wallet address, only that wallet address is allowed to present proofs for that account. And if you start racking up failed requests, you'll basically, no one's going to accept proofs from that Web2 account anymore. Um, and then, like for oracles, what Chainlink specializes in, if you want like a price feed, there might not be an actual like specific account tied to it, so we have to solve the uh, Sybil issue in a different way. So what you can do is you can have the actual oracle itself, because this is an MPC scheme, so like in the private user data scheme, like the client is like, let's say my iPhone, but in this case, the, the client would be an Oracle that has like staked on the network, and you just limit the number of Oracles. So if the Oracle starts racking up failed requests, it can get slashed. Great, so this is how you can actually bring off-chain data on-chain in a verifiable way. What's the utility? Uh, this is what I'm like pretty proud to talk about because it validates like the whole thesis of our company, so. Uh, this is like a new influencer marketing uh, business. Like the backstory here is the founder of this company is called Daisy. His name is Ray. My co-founder and I went to talk to him about something completely unrelated. I actually forget what we talked to him about. But when we told him we could do ZKPs on like any API that exists, he got really excited because he had this business, like he spotted this business opportunity that he didn't think was possible until uh, we came to talk to him. And it's basically an organized shilling network. <laughs> so, and this is a huge market that actually exists today. So if I'm like a young TikTok influencer, if I'm trying to make money, there's like many group chats of like thousands of these influencers. I'll get like a brand deal for makeup and I'll go coordinate with like a few other influencers to like, when I post a video, they'll like, comment, they'll engage with it just to like boost it in the algorithm. And then when I get paid, we'll all like split up the money. And uh, like right now, they basically use screenshots in the honor system uh, to like manage that whole uh, economy, but with uh, ZK TLS, you can actually generate a ZKP that you actually uh, liked or commented on like uh, a video within the time frame you're supposed to, and you can scale this market a lot more quickly. And they started back in like February, and they've already done like half a million in revenue, or they've taken like half a million from brands and uh, distributed it to an influencer since then. Um, and we also made like a meme app. Uh, it's up on test flight if you want to play with it and you can scan the QR code. It's purely for marketing, like I don't think there's business value here, but I, we made this because I, get, I just got tired of explaining to people the new stuff that you can do. I'd rather just actually build it and show people. But uh, one fun use case is like Alok on, if you're on Farcaster, he's like a really proud bald guy on Farcaster, so he's gonna start a verified bald channel because the 23andMe API actually exposes like your odds of being bald. <laughs> But it, like, in the app, like, uh, if you scan the QR code, you can come talk to me afterwards. There's just really stupid games that you can play. Like, you can prove how much Neanderthal DNA you have. It's like a meme proof of humanity. Or if you bought GameStop during the short squeeze because we got the Robinhood API, you can like, retroactively give out, get yourself an NFT for that. Like, uh, being a participant, I of course didn't. Made a test uh, purchase like, back in April. Um, and then you can also like, export your social graph from Twitter if you really wanted to. Um, and the last one there is actually, uh, there might be business family here, was like, you can prove how early you got equity in some company. So like, uh, the early optimism employees actually have their like, uh, equity managed through Carta. And because optimism is so big now, like proving that you got, like we're an early participant in that company could actually be worth money. Like you can mint that as an NFT for how early you got equity there and then potentially sell it if people are interested or just like as like a badge of honor. But uh, I'm like pretty confident at this point that ZK TLS will unlock like a Cambrian explosion of just new products that we'll see in Web3. And uh, I encourage you to spend some time to think of any ideas you have. <laughs>